For those of you I haven't met, my name is Maria Fernandez. I am Erica's mom and I'm, his, I'm an attorney and this is some of what I do. So life planning documents mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. For some people, all they worry about is their powers of attorney and living wills, which believe me, a power of attorney is a very important document that everyone should have because it's valid while you're alive. And every, well, we're gonna talk about each of these specific ones. Wills and trusts are what happens when you're gone. Like, who do you not want to give your stuff to? Which, believe me, that happens sometimes. And there's individuals who, yesterday I met with a man, his entire estate is going to the Children's Hospital Foundation because they saved his daughter's life. And so he's giving everything. Sadly, his daughter didn't live past 50, but he's grateful for the 50 years he had her. But then there's others that do a combination of both, and we're going to talk about that. So. If you want a copy of this and you gave us an email, we can send you a copy of this if you want it, okay? To do any of these documents, you have to have the capacity to do it. What does that mean? You have to be able to understand what you have and you have to have the mental capacity to do it. Now, you can be physically disabled and have mental capacity. I have clients that have cerebral palsy and are totally 100% capable of making a mark or an X or some form of signature it's their body that makes it difficult for them to function day to day, but they know what they have and what they want, who they want to leave it to. So capacity is the most important part of this. If you do not have mental capacity, you can't sign any of these documents and have them stamped. This is the story of the time I went to the nursing home and the daughter said, no, my mom's totally, she's great. She can sign anything. She didn't recognize her daughter. She had no clue why I was there. And I'm going, we can't sign these papers. Mom died without a will. Other times, I've never forgotten this one lady who ends up in the hospital, her kids go to the house looking for papers, powers of attorney, anything. Mom can't, can no longer speak, but she's up here 100%. What they found was a will that an alleged minister helped her do, and I say this in quotations, he had no church, there was no congregation or temple or synagogue. He was a self-ordained minister. His entire, her entire state went to this man who mm -hmm. they did not know. This was not the minister they grew up with at their church. This was not the minister that they went to, did their father's funeral. No, this is a stranger. They found that will and they called me. One of them was my client, said, you've got to help us. This is what we found. I went to the hospital and I went up to this lady and I introduced myself and she shook her head. And I go, do you understand what I'm saying? She shook her head. I go, your children found a will that leaves everything to the Reverend John Smith. No, it was violent nose shaking mm -hmm. her head. She knew exactly what she wanted. The next question was, do I split everything between your two kids? Yes. Can you make a mark for me? And there's a way to sign a will if you're unable to do a signature. You make an X, the X is witnessed by two people, and then on top of that, we double, there's wording that goes with it. She signed it, that will got probated. The ultimate of hypocrisy was the day the man came to the funeral. And he showed up and they, like, what gall, right? And he said, have you found her will yet? And the daughter said, she has a new one. He turned around and walked out the door. Yeah. So that one worked and she, all she could do was shake her head and make an X. So sometimes the goal is not to do it on your deathbed, but the goal is to be able to do it when you can totally do that. What do I have to do to make sure you have capacity? I ask questions, believe it or not, when someone uh, gets a guardian appointed for them, when the team comes to see them, they ask them questions like, what year is this? Who's the president? Do you know who your senator is? What medications do you take? They go through this whole litany of questions by the psychologist or a psychiatrist, psychologist or a social worker. I ask similar questions, but usually it's in conversation to figure out if they know what's going on. I find out, do they know who they are, why we're here? Did you understand that your children brought you here to do this, et cetera? And then they have to know the object of their bounty, which she goes to me the other day. What's object of your bounty? What that means is I know what stuff I have. That's my bounty. And the object is who I'm giving it to. That's a line out of a case that's about 100 years old. Do they know the object of their bounty? So if you came to me and said, I want to leave everything to my spouse and then in equal shares to my three kids, you obviously know the logical progression of who you want to leave it to. Now, if you came to me with your kids and suddenly you said, well, I met this guy at the grocery store the other day. He was really nice. And he asked me to marry him. And the daughter's like, and we have, these stories are not made up. These stories are what I call the horror stories you learn from. 
This woman met a man at the grocery store in produce, and she was gonna marry him, and this whole thing just blew up. Sadly, we had to get her a guardian. She was beyond, she thought it was another year. She thought she'd been married to this man for a while. She was totally confused. But if you know the object of the bounty and you're coherent and lucid, then we can sign it. So that's the first question. Do we have capacity? Assuming we do, those are the four, three and a half, because the DNR form, I don't create it, but I'll tell you what it is. Your last will and testament slash trust, because we'll get to that, disposes of your property. I give it to my kids in equal shares. If I have no kids, I give it to my nieces and nephews, brothers, sisters, whomever. Charity, your choice. If you're lucid, you can do whatever you want. Power of attorney, especially for either financial issues or medical issues, is why you are alive. It dies with you. So if you have a power of attorney, like my husband does, which is a durable power of attorney, he could wipe out the bank accounts today. Now, I could wipe out his at the credit union, but you assume at a certain point you trust each other not to do that. There, I will get into more specific details about that. The living will or an appointment of a healthcare surrogate is if you can no longer make your medical decisions, you're still alive, but you trust someone to do it for you. So they talk to the doctors, they talk to the specialists. The DNR form that I do not take credit for, but it does exist, is an EMS form. I've only done it two or three times in 30 years, and that's the one that you sign that EMS will recognize on every door in your house, on the windows that your caretaker gives them because you went home to die. DN EMS, if they come to your house and you do not have a DNR, they're gonna try to revive you. That's their job. They will put you on, they'll trach you, they'll put you on a respirator, they'll do whatever it takes to get you to the hospital, which is what they did to my brother in Florida when he had a heart attack. Now, ultimately, they took him off the machines, he wasn't gonna make it, but if he had had the EMS form put on the door, they never would have put him on the machine that pumped his heart for him and did all that other stuff. So that is a form set out by the state of Kentucky that all the EMS responders will recognize. I've only had three or, I mean, three, maybe four clients do that. One who was in complete kidney failure. He was going home to die. He brought all of his kids to the hospital. He signed it in the hospital and said to them, I want you to honor this. And they all said yes. And he, he was the one I'd never forgotten because we were literally in his hospital room signing it. He went home, he passed about a week later. But that's the form that's put out by the state. A will. It is a last will or testament, codicil, appointment by will. It's a writing in the nature of a will in the exercise of the power of a testamentary disposition. Within that will, there's two kinds of gifts. A bequest is a gift of personal property. I hereby give my nephew, my 1968 Corvette, and if he passes away, then it becomes part of my estate. Or I give somebody my china, which by the way, nobody wants china, I find out. <laughs> um, nobody wants sterling silver, nobody wants any of that stuff anymore. Um, but that's because of personal property or cash. You can say I leave $5,000 to my church, to MPI, to whomever, okay? That's a bequest of personal property. Cash and bank accounts, stock accounts, those are personal property. Now, if you have a piece of real estate, I had a charity receive a piece of land that was basically the side of a, of a cliff. Mm -hmm. And that's what he inherited. And he goes, I don't want this. What am I gonna do with this? I don't even live in that state. Mm -hmm. We found the adjoining landowner and they had they didn't do anything with it. It was literally a mountaintop. They had given it away to another charity and so we gave this piece to the charity. So they had the whole thing. They sold it all. But that's a, that's a device of real property. House, land, something you walk on. So if you're leaving your house to somebody, that's what that is. The requirements of a valid will has to be in writing. You obviously have to have capacity. Requires two witnesses and a notary, unless you do a holographic will that I do not recommend. That means, I see this when people go out of town and they have little kids and they've never done a will, they write it all out before they leave. The whole thing has to be in your handwriting, from top to bottom, signature and date. No witnesses, no, I write it, then they notarize it, you just blew it if you did that. A holographic will has to be 100% in your handwriting and nothing else. And I've seen it like a couple times where someone has done it. The court will probate it if it has those requirements. Otherwise, what you want is something in writing that's got two witnesses and the notaries. And the witnesses have to attest in the document that you signed it in front of them 
They signed it in front of you and in front of each other. Otherwise, they won't accept it. Because I've seen those legal, what is it, legal zoom on TV that you see? I have never probated one of those wills because they don't tell the people how to do it correctly. So people fill it in and they fill in the blanks. It's not 100% in their handwriting, so it's not holographic, and then it's not executed the right way. So it gets thrown out. I've had never had been able to probate a legal zoom will. So you're better off if you don't know a lawyer, ask your friends, ask your family. Call the Bar Association's Legal Referral Service. They'll give you names, but please don't do legal zoom. Who's the testator? That's you all. That's the person writing the will. Testatrix is the female version of testator. I just told you what the bequest was. The residue is what's left of your estate. Now there's a difference between what's left of your estate and what the probate assets are down in the middle. Anything that has a beneficiary, like your IRAs if you have one, or an insurance policy that you name one of your kids as beneficiary, that is not part of your probate estate. That is literally outside of probate. So you have two buckets. You have what goes through probate that the court watches and makes sure it gets disposed. And then you have all your beneficiary designated assets over here. And you always have a trust, which is also outside of probate. But most people, for what goes through probate is, your, I joke, I, I have one client who has a car in a small checking account for groceries. That's where their social security money goes to. That's, that's what's going through their estate. That's it. Everything else, they put it in a trust or it has a beneficiary on it. One thing you have to be worried about in Kentucky is Kentucky has an inheritance tax. Now, it doesn't apply to husbands, wives, children, grandchildren, brothers and sisters, and parents. The minute you hit nieces and nephews and anyone else beyond those, they pay inheritance tax. Your friends, uh, charities don't pay tax, but that's assuming charity is over here. In terms of family, if you hit to nieces and nephews, great-grandchildren, uh, cousins, anybody but that first class, which is class A, class A, you will pay inheritance tax or your estate will. So you have to make sure that if you're doing that, you leave enough assets in the probate estate to pay taxes. Because nothing is worse than calling the woman who got X number of dollars under a beneficiary account and saying, by the way, I need $1,000, $1,500 from you for your inheritance taxes because it's not in the estate. And people do those TODs on accounts, transfer on death, payable on death. It's very nice that you wanna benefit someone, but if you do that, it goes straight to the beneficiary, and then whoever you've named as the executor, the person who's managing your affairs, has to go back to them and say, um, I know aunt so-and-so did this, this, and this, but could I have some money back so we could pay taxes? Because otherwise, you've just left your executor in a very bad place. Executors are the ones that do this work afterwards. They're called marshalling the assets, assets and paying the debts and then distributing everything. Now, most of my estates are solvent. They have money, they can pay, but every now and then you have a tragic incident and there's not enough money to pay everybody. There's one I have right now in Bullard County where the house was underwater, there's not enough money, we can't pay EMS, the estate's insolvent. You are not responsible for that person's debts personally. So if you are named the executor of someone's estate like that, it's the estate that's liable, not the executor, not the trustee, not anyone who has been named to do these jobs. So there what happens is you disallow the claim if they file it. EMS, by the way, EMS always files a claim. If you get to take into the hospital and then you pass away and they know there's an estate, they will file a claim. It's without fail. I think that's first and that's all they do. And then you have to fight them to get it released. Because what happens is if you have insurance, they'll pay it. If you have Medicare, they'll pay it but EMS won't release it unless you ask them to do it. So, oh, I went too far, go back. The executor and guardian. Anybody in this room have a minor child? Okay, and you once did, and did you have a will that named a guardian? That's the thing that's funny, is when people come to see me and they go, we made it to 18, and I go, huh? My kids made it to 18 and never had a problem, I didn't need a guardian. Well, I tell people that's not what to aspire to. The thing is to do a will because God forbid something happens to you, you want your children to go with the people you want them to go to. So if one side of the family is all upright, law-abiding and everything, and the other side, they're crack dealers, what side do you want them to go to? The law-abiding side, right? I have seen people that had no documents. Here's the perfect case, which was so sad. We had a gentleman who was mentally ill. 
killed his wife, and then killed himself. Neither one of them had a will. He was mentally ill, schizophrenic. It ran in the family on his side. Her side fought for the little girl. She was six years old. And of course, there was $240,000 worth of insurance money. That makes it even more complicated. The court appointed a bank as the guardian or conservator of that money. So that took the fight out of the money. Once he took the fight out of the money, the crazy people went away. And her sister got appointed guardian. That's the last thing you want to put a kid through. Because in the meantime, she was sitting in foster care. So that's what guardians is here. Um, types of property. Are your house, who has a house in their name only? Uh, who has a, okay. If you have a house that's in joint with right of survivorship, that goes to the survivor if one of you dies and the survivor survives you. So my house is in joint with right of survivorship, so if I walk out in front of a beer truck and Anheuser-Busch has to pay for killing me, then my husband will not only get the house, he'll get the recovery from Anheuser-Busch because they shouldn't have hit me. Realistically speaking, yeah, I tell people don't walk out in front of a bus. A beer truck, they have money. Um, or bourbon or somebody that has money. If you're gonna get hit by something, get hit by someone that's got money. And so, so far nobody's taken me up on it, which is okay. But it's a suggestion, no, no city buses. But anything that's joint with right of survivorship goes to your survivors. So any account that's an or, like bank accounts, stock accounts, your house, your car, Whatever it is, if it's an or, it goes to the survivor. If it's a sole name, it's part of that probate estate. If it is an and, half of it, your half, goes through probate. You don't wanna do and unless it's not your spouse. If you have brothers and sisters and you each own a piece of land together, you can do and because you want your share to go to your kids. But typically between husband and wife, we do ors. Okay. All adults should have a will, and even minors who have children. If you have a 16-year-old who's had a child, they can do a will only to name a guardian. They can't dispose of property because they're not, unless they're emancipated, but they can name uh, a, a guardian. Usually you're probated after the funeral. So if you want the funeral to include a jazz band from New Orleans, do not put that in your will because nobody will know it. Arrange it beforehand. And I have yet to see a single child change anything mom, dad, grandma, anybody did if it's paid for. So if you have the wherewithal to arrange your funeral, pay it in advance, you'll get what you want. Otherwise, I've seen five or six kids in one family that fought for like two days over the funeral arrangements because nobody had done anything. Nobody had even put it in writing. Now I give people a form that says, these are my final dispositions, this is what I want, if, and you can check off, yes, it's paid, yes, it's not paid. The whole thing is laid out what you want. My mom used to joke she wanted a jazz band at her funeral. Um, I don't know if that's still the case, but that's her joke. My father didn't have an all-out big funeral. Two hours of visitation, he was cremated. My mom made that decision. But when you're all gone and between you husbands and wives, then it's kids making these decisions. You make it easier on them if you write it all out and you've done it already. Co-executors, the people who have to do these jobs, if they're in different states, it makes life really hard. I had one estate that had an executor here, North Carolina, and Louisiana. You had to send the checks to three different states before you could mail them out. If you're gonna do co-executors, at least try to make sure there are two of the kids that live in this, within distance of each other, driving distance, or they live in the same city. The other problem too, if you're co-executor, both of you have to sign it. Most institutions require two signatures on the check, two signatures on the stock transfers, Two signatures on a deed to sell a house if you're co-executors. A trust. It's an express trust that's created either by a separate instrument or under a will. If it's under a will, it's called a testamentary trust. Most of the time you see that with minor kids. It says that if something happens to me and my children are under this age, I name so-and-so to be my trustee until they turn whatever. And you set the ages. Now, you've seen how old my child is. She's already past the ages that I put in one of those documents. Mm -hmm. So it means that if I wanted to do this and make it that she doesn't get money until she's 60 years old, I'd have to do a new one. I have had people put things in trust for lifetimes till they're age 50, 55, and 60. I had one gentleman who got mad at his son because his, the son's wife, the daughter-in-law, would not let him see the grandkids. Mm -hmm. He came and changed his will only as to the son 
that he doesn't get anything until he's 16 years old. Mm -hmm. The daughter that he had, it stayed at 25, 30, and 35. Don't piss off the one with the money, basically. <laughs> but uh, he couldn't see his grandkids, so he said, "Why, if, you're not, if I'm not part of your family, why am I doing this? You can have lifetime trust, and usually when we do lifetime trust, it's because someone needs it. They have a special need, they have a physical special need, they're spendthrifts. If you gave them $10, they'd spend 1000 They have their money has to be managed for them. We had a client in the old firm that I was with who went out and bought a car. He was almost 90, did not have a driver's license, did not have insurance, and they gave him the car. He said, my trust will pay for it, which the trust would not pay for it. He was not supposed to be driving. So he drove the car off the lot and drove it far enough, did not hit anything, thankfully. Car was perfect condition. But then he calls my partner, who's one of the trustees, and says, guess what I did? And he goes, well, what did you do? He thought he meant like I went somewhere and took a trip. I bought a car. He did what? We had to pay the dealer $1,000 for wear and tear on the car for him to take it back and totally you know, void out the contract. Because he signed it. He financed the whole thing. My trust will pay for it. So that's, that's another reason. If you have a child, a family relative, someone who has a problem with money that you can't trust, then you can create it. For most people, trusts are done as revocable living documents. You take care of yourself first, you take care of your spouse, you take care of your kids. And it's all set out in there to the point that some people call them will substitutes. Because your will is very plain then. At that point, the only thing that your will will govern is likely your car. I do not put cars in trust unless you tell me you have a 1968 Corvette that's worth $65,000. I have a client who has a 95 foot yacht. I have another one who has a private plane. They're not selling those items. They're gonna keep them till the day they die. They're in the trust and the clerk has finally figured out how to do it. Believe it or not, it's easier to put a boat in a plane than there in a car. Hmm. And you'd think it would be the other way around, but it's not. So what you do though with the trust is this, whether it's under a will or a separate document, is you set out the parameters, what, what's gonna happen with the income, what's gonna happen with the property and you set the ages. You have to have intent, just like a will, you have to write it. it, has to have a permitted purpose. What that means is, at some point in this country's history, there were documents that said that you could not benefit people of certain races, that you could not sell houses to certain groups. There were trusts like that too, that if someone married someone outside their race, they could get no money. That's considered against public policy. I've yet had a client ever that said to me that they wanted to do something like that, but I, I know that those documents have existed in the past. You can either use a trustee that's corporate or an individual. By that I mean, if we do a living trust for me, I'm the initial trustee. Ray can be my backup, and then I can name a third backup if something happens to him to distribute to them. If you have a situation where you have a child that need, has a special need, I do some work with individuals whose children have Down syndrome. Now they live in supported housing and they have done trusts that allow for special ease, like vacations, trips out of town, traveling companions, a handicapped van. They could even buy a house for that beneficiary because a house is exempt for certain benefit programs like Medicaid. None of these people have high income, these beneficiaries. All of them basically have their SSDI and some of them work at supported workshops like Zoom group and stuff, but if that's your beneficiary, then what you do is sometimes it's gotta continue beyond the people you know, so you use a trustee as your benefit, as your corporate trustee. And there's a couple, I favor certain smaller banks because they're more personal, and I hope I'm not offending anyone who works at PNC Bank, but I don't like the big giant banks because your stuff gets sent out of town. Chase Bank, you deal with Dallas. Um, somebody else you deal with Pittsburgh. Um, the local banks, you actually have a person that your child or individual can talk to. Uh, and the beneficiary, it's the object of your bounty. Who are the people you care about? You have to have a beneficiary. And there's lots of different kinds of trusts. Again, who should be the trustee may depend on who the beneficiary is. If they have special needs, I already get that. This is important really if you do have a child with a special need or an individual. And an advisory committee, is it appropriate? I had a couple of clients, sadly one of them's already passed away, who was a child who was severely brain damaged at birth. They had an advisory committee that included a social worker, the doctor who took care of her after she was born, and another person that was a friend of the family. Those were the advisory committee because mom was concerned that there wouldn't be any continuity if she was gone. 
and the bank who was managing the money, because we were talking about significant dollars, wouldn't know about this child's life. So sometimes when that's the case, you lose a committee. You don't always put one on there. Power of attorney. This is the one that you have when you're alive, which for most people can be more important than the will. Because for example, honestly, if all you have is a spouse and kids and you die without a will, it gets split between those people, half to your spouse and half to your kids. Now, if everything is in joint names and you die and you don't have a will, it's gonna go to the survivors. But if you get hit by that beer truck and it doesn't kill you, who's gonna to talk to the doctors? Who's gonna pay your bills? I have a client who went skiing and broke both of his arms. You know how you see in the movies of guys that walk around and they got this thing? <laughs> they really do that. And he did not have a power of attorney. So we figured out a way that he could sign against the wall because he could use his hand. So when I got the phone call from his wife, I go, he did what? How old is he again? Um, he went and he broke both his arms, but when he came in, we put the paper on the side of the wall and he was able to sign his name. I only needed one and we got it recorded with the county clerk. And so just once you record it, you can use copies of a recorded document. But that's what you want to avoid, not being able to pay your bills. The other thing you want to avoid if you have a medical or a healthcare power of attorney is the client who, sadly, this didn't turn out the way it should have. He did not have a power of attorney. He and his wife decided to drive back from Florida all in one night. They didn't make it. They had an accident on the way here in the middle of Georgia lost control of the car, went into a ditch, neither one of them survived. But they kept him alive as long as possible so they could find the kid, but the kid didn't have power of attorney, so they put them on life support because that's what emergency rooms do. They try to keep you alive. One of the kids flew down and with paper from a court there was able to take them up because it was, they weren't getting better. That's what you don't want. So if you've got a healthcare power of attorney, they can make those decisions for you. Recording it means I take it to the county clerk's office. It is public record. The world knows you have a power of attorney and who your people are that you've named. Every document has its successor. So if you appoint someone's power of attorney, I'll go, I need another one. Because you could both be in the same car together. Spouses tend to travel together. Parents and children might travel together. So you always need a backup. And that's on every position here. Whether it's the power of attorney, the executor position, doesn't matter. I need a backup for every single document of how to do it. Uh, one of my old partners, I found one of his documents the other day because believe it or not, the lady's still living. So we dug this out of storage. Her power of attorney had died before her and she never changed it. And there was no backup. They got a guardian instead. That's what you want to avoid because then the court's in the middle of your life. You have to report to them, tell them what you have, what you're spending your money on. Uh, they limit you know, what, is, what you can do for the other person. Um, discuss gifting. Some powers of attorney give the attorney, in fact, the person you named, the ability to make gifts. Now, right now, for federal estate tax purposes, if you have more than $12 million in your name individually, you need to worry about federal estate taxes, which start at 40%. If you don't have combined $25 million, basically, you don't have to worry about the feds. However, there's some people that for years have been making annual gifts to their kids. It used to be 10,000 per person per year that you didn't have to worry about gift tax. There's some people that still do that because they can, which is great. They've helped grandchildren buy houses. They've done all kinds of stuff. But do you want your power of attorney to continue that? Some people would prefer not that, to do that. <coughs> Others, if it's one of their children gifting to their children, they have no problem with it. So gifting is not automatically in there. The sale of real estate. If you think your house may need to be sold, we include the language that lets the power of attorney sell your house or sell any real estate. Without it, they have to go get something else because you cannot sell real estate under a power of attorney unless it specifically gives you that power. Who should serve as the same person would be guardian if necessary. I put a provision in my power of attorney that says if I need a conservator, someone to manage my money, I want that to be the same person as my power of attorney. That's what most people want. If they trust you now, they're gonna trust you in the future. And again, the co-attorneys, in fact, if you've got one here and one in Louisiana, you've got a problem because they're gonna want both of you to sign. On the issue of charitable giving, one of the benefits of being able to do that in your will is that you get a charitable deduction if and when your estate is large enough. Now, for most people, federally, the estate being large enough is over $12 million. 
So a lot of clients say, I'm not worried about that. But they do want to worry about taking care of those that have taken care of them. Whether it's a religious organization, a special interest group, a charity like MPI, the whole point is there's different ways to do this. In your will or your trust, you can make an outright gift to charity. Simple bequest of a dollar amount of appreciated stock. I had a client who gave away a piece of a mountain to a charity in the area where it was at. So you can give away all kinds of things. You can do charitable trusts where you retain the income for life and then the charity gets the asset when you're gone. You can also do the reverse, especially when you have appreciated assets. That last um, line there, the gifts of appreciated assets bring possible tax benefits. If you, for example, got in at Amazon or Microsoft or Apple when it was dirt cheap and now it's too expensive to sell because of capital gains, there are ways to work with charitable giving where you can continue to receive the income, the charity gets the asset at the end. And retirement accounts and IRAs are always sticky things for different kinds of people. Sometimes you have no beneficiaries that would be eligible for rollover, your spouse has predeceased you. Or if you give it to your children or grandchildren, they take it out over 10 years. If that's a tax burden to them, sometimes I've actually had children tell parents, don't give me your IRA, give it to someone else, give me the house, give me the vacation condo in Florida, whatever it might be. But if you name the charity as a beneficiary, there are no tax implications when the money comes out of the account. So talk to your accountant, talk to your lawyer, but these are advantages of charitable giving. The living will. This is the one that says, withhold or don't withhold, or I don't want life prolonging treatment, I do not want to be plugged in and kept on a respirator forever. That's what this document is. Most people, if they're married, name their spouse, unless they can't do it, or their children. Um, I've got people who don't have either of those and they name nieces and nephews, but it's someone that you've talked to that says, I understand what you want. My mother once said to us, I do not want to be put on a machine. She said that to all four of us. The three of us that are left still remember it and mom will not be put on a machine. And that's just it, she doesn't want it. I had one gentleman who lived on life support for over six years. He did not have a document and finally mom couldn't do it anymore. The daughters took over, they went to court, they got him taken off, he died within hours. The only thing keeping him alive was that machine. But it cost them six years worth of nursing home treatment so you can figure it cost them about $400,000 and he wasn't there, he was long gone. And he had a massive brain aneurysm and she just couldn't do it. If he had one of these, he didn't have any documents. One of these, that would never have happened. The document now, the new document I use also says whether or not you wanna make organ donations. A lot of people have it on their back of their licenses already. I remind people, which this is personal, there's some religious issues involved, some people don't believe in it. If you have no opposition to it, I remind people they can even use your skin. In Miami, where I came from, the burn unit is always needing that because it's such a huge city and it's a level one trauma center. So they'll take whatever you give them, corneas for people that are blind. So my mother says if they want to take an old lady's uh, eyes, they'll have to wear glasses, but they won't be blind. <laughs> so that's my mom's attitude about it, but it's true. So you can also put that on there. Some people are averse to it, but I think it's worth it. Um, life prolonging treatment is anything that basically sustains you and keeps you going and prolongs the dying process. That's how it's defined. It is not treatment for pain. So you will get the morphine, whatever medication you need to relieve pain issues. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a gentleman who was on respirator for six years. Terminal condition is any of those. And if you guys signed up, you'll get a copy of this. So I don't think I need to read that. And you can only do this for someone if they can't do it for themselves. So they come in from the car accident, they've been sedated because of the injuries are so great, then they will to look to you as the healthcare surrogate. So as long as I'm capable of saying I want it or don't want it, the healthcare surrogate has no job. Again, must be 18 years and older, has to be in writing, signed and dated, either notarized or witnessed by two people. Um, can't be relatives can't be beneficiaries, cannot be your attending physician, cannot be employees of the hospital where you're at. So literally, I tell people, if this is what you're doing, come here. To you, my witnesses are my staff. They're none of those people. So that doesn't present a problem. Uh, hospitals will not let their people witness anything at all. 
and it's not applicable if you're pregnant. So if you're a woman and you're pregnant, if you're a man and you're pregnant, I wanna be your agent, okay? But for women, if you are pregnant and it's a viable fetus, meaning they can bring it to term and then have it delivered, they will not take you off life support. And that has happened. Okay, I've already talked about that. Copies should be given to your doctor, your kids, your spouse, anybody who could be involved in this process that needs to know it. So before my mom moved to live with my sister up in the middle of Florida, her doctor had a copy of her living will. I'm sure my sister, who's incredibly efficient at these things, has already given them the, the paperwork at the new doctors that she found in Melbourne, Florida, because you want them to have it. Living wills are not the do not resuscitate form that I mentioned before. If you give a living will paper like I have prepared, which is two pages long, EMS will not even look at it because they will not recognize it. Then again, you have the same problem with people that are co. You can put or, you can put any of my children, you can put either or, you can do this, but if you make them co, both of them have to show up. The do not resuscitate form. EMS, it's the only one they recognize, has to be totally completed, and please tell your family if you want this. It's available in English and Spanish. That's what it looks like. It's very simple. You can, and I had this happen at least once, I had a guardian of a, of a younger brother, he was disabled. The older brother who was the guardian signed it for him. And they will honor that, but it has to be that form. And I tell people, you put it on the front door, you put it on the door of the bedroom, you put it on the back door, you make you have a couple of copies by the door, or EMS will not honor it at all. And uh, that's the explanations on the DNR. I included in that in case anybody was interested. And bingo, that's it. I don't know, let's shut this off. Oh, my pleasure. Do you guys have any questions? Because we still have a few minutes. I didn't talk as fast as I usually do. <laughs> Yes, mm -hmm. okay. The one first slide you had where you had six boxes up there. Can you go back to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you put, you were talking yeah. about second or third slide? Yeah, yeah, I know which one it is. I gotta. Okay. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Okay, what is the difference between. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that's not the box. It was one having to do with power of attorney, medical, and then. Financial. No, it, it said power of attorney, medical, and power of attorney, financial. But then down below that, it said something else. So here's the power of attorney one. And then the next one is the pricing considerations. Okay, I can't remember. But there were two different things that had to do with health. Okay. You can do a financial, you, you can do a healthcare power of attorney completely separate from a living will. Okay, okay. So some people do healthcare powers of attorney because of the fact that they know that sometimes they don't remember and they'll go to the doctor and they want, someone goes with them. It's like a HIPAA form. Okay. One of the, I didn't put it in here, but I also do a HIPAA form for people that says, my husband can talk to the doctor or whomever it is. Okay. With the power of attorney, they can make decisions that are not life threatening. The difference between a living will, it's you're basically shutting off life prolonging care. You are taking someone off a respirator, you're, you're denying treatment. My brother Joey died of a massive heart attack, but he was dying of cancer. So my mother found him, she put him in an ambulance and she said, okay, go ahead. And they put that thing on you that just keeps beating your heart because she wanted my sister-in-law to have a chance to say goodbye. So once that happened, then they took him off and Joey passed, but he was already dying. We knew this, he had cancer. If you have a situation where you have someone who's not sick, they have a heart attack for some reason, or a stroke or something, and you want them to get to the hospital and not have them a chance, that's where the, fine, the medical power of attorney comes in because you can authorize treatment. Okay. Living Will says, no, we're done, shut them off. So my brother didn't have any of these papers, even though- So a power of attorney does not give you the right to shut it off. Yes, it does, but it also gives you the right to do more. So the power of attorney is better yes. than the living Well, you can have both. When it comes to your right. health care. I do both because one is valid during a lifetime mm -hmm. and it's all the decision making to authorize it. Okay. You don't need to have that one in order to turn it off. Okay. You can have different people on it. All right. You talked about having to pay taxes on gifts. 
That's uh, depending on who it's to. Okay, if I leave something to somebody, if I leave, say, X amount of dollars mm -hmm. to a friend, mm -hmm. she has to pay taxes on it this. It comes out of the estate. That's why I tell people, you have to be careful when you do this. If you put, I had one lady, everything she had was under TOD or POD that the stockbrokers tell you, do this, it's great, you avoid probate. Mm -hmm. Yes, you avoid probate, but then your poor executor who's got to give some of the stuff to people has got to go back to them and say, by the way, you're not a non-taxable beneficiary, I need X number of dollars for taxes. Because the executor's on the hook for that. The estate has to have enough money to pay its taxes. Okay. I have some McDonald's stock. If I transfer that TOD to my grandchildren, okay, they don't grandchildren have to are okay. Okay. It's friends, nieces, and nephews, great grandchildren. And sometimes this happens without even trying. Someone you left it to was an exempt beneficiary, but the next generation is not. The person died, so it passes to their kid because you allowed it. They pay. Great grandchildren pay. How, or, do, you, how do you know how much money to leave in your estate? Well, you, it, it depends on how you do this. You can calculate it today. If you told me the stock was worth X and it was going to a friend or a niece or nephew, I can tell you approximately how much the tax is. It's about 14%. Mm -hmm. So if it's $1,000, you gotta figure 140. But some people, they do these things, they never get a will, suddenly everybody's getting TOD stuff, and then we go to probate a will because we have to. The revenue cabinet doesn't care who you are, they're coming. And so that's what happens. And then your poor executor or administrator, if you don't have a will, is going back to people saying, uh, can I have $140 to pay your taxes? And I had one lady who did that and there were six beneficiaries and two of them, were, they didn't want to do it. What we did was, well, if you don't pay us, we'll tell the revenue cabinet where to find you and they'll come get it. But you don't want to do that because all of these six people were related, but they weren't children. They were nieces and nephews and great nieces. And put someone in the middle of this mess. If you leave money to a non-profit, they don't pay Not tax. Not a problem. They don't pay tax. You can do it any way you want. You can do it as, I've had people set up charitable trusts. I've had people do TODs to a charity if the bank will let you. I've had people just take it out as a will. But charities do not, if they are 501c3, they are totally exempt from tax. Is it true that a, benef a beneficiary cannot be an executor as well? That's not true because I'm, I was the executor of my father's estate. And if my mother had been living, we were all named beneficiaries. Okay. Now, now what you've got to make sure is if you've got more than one child, I'm the one who's got the accounting degree and a law degree. My sister studied fine arts. Who's the executor? Me. You're my sister would honestly tell you that she'd rather wash windows than do math. <laughs> That's not her. So don't assume that it's your oldest child. It's the child who's got the abilities to do it because you've got to file papers, you've got to do math, you've got to do taxes. Your last tax return has to be filed, things like that. Mm -hmm. So my sister will honestly tell you, she said that once, I'd rather do windows than do math. Mm -hmm. And so Amy will not be an executor, I am. But a beneficiary cannot be a witness. No, exactly, never. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, and I had one over here. Oh yeah, previous wills. If I had a will before and then I got married, does that will become null and void? No. So that will still stands. Except for the fact that, okay, I had another life, I had a will, I got married, but my husband's not in it. So what can happen is you cannot disinherit your spouse, no matter how you like him or dislike him or her. What will happen is that your spouse can renounce the will and take half your estate. Okay. So they can set it aside as to the provisions that leave him out or her out and take half of the estate and then everything else stands. So if your prior will says, I leave everything to my nieces and nephews, okay? But then you get married, and you don't change your will, and you die first, your husband can then come back and say, ah, she just forgot, which may be the case. We'll set it aside, I get the, I get 50% off the top, and everything else goes the way you put it in the will. Okay. So you technically cannot disinherit a spouse because there's a statute that protects them. However, you can disinherit children. And sometimes you disinherit them, not because they're bad kids, but because they're special needs children, they're on Social Security, Medicaid, they, they can't inherit because it'll disqualify them for benefits. So we have done wills where it says, I do not leave money to Johnny, not because I don't love him, but that because he's been provided for otherwise. And then if you go down, 
it refers to a special needs trust that if somebody else dies first, the money goes to that trust, which is for you. <coughs> so you can disinherit a spouse, whether in whatever the reason, they're not guaranteed an inheritance. Are you worried yet? <laughs> <laughs> I intend to spend it all, so there's not gonna be anything left. That's actually what I tell my clients, spend it all. Okay, if you, if you include your husband and your spouse, do you have to leave him 50%? Uh, typically, you have to leave them at least that because they still have the motivation to renounce. So if I say I want to leave Jim 25% of my He whatever. can renounce the will and take 50. Okay. Now, there are people who do post-nups, <coughs> meaning a post-marital, mm -hmm. where they each sign off and they agree that they're not leaving anything to each other for other reasons, and we have an agreement and people are okay with it. Or because one of them's got an inheritance and the other one doesn't, and you end up with an upside down situation so that one leaves everything straight to the kids and the other one then takes care of the spouse back and forth. There's reasons sometimes not to leave it to your spouse, including the issue of Medicaid. I mean, if there are, I've had people with a husband or wife in the nursing home and the kids are all on board, he has no clue what's going on and we've done that on purpose because he loses better. So we take that and we rearrange it, so. But there, there are reasons sometimes that you don't leave things to your spouse. They have more money than God, whatever. Um, you married a Rockefeller or something. Mm -hmm. And your money's going this way. And sometimes you're not even leaving it to kids, you're leaving it to charities. Mm -hmm. And everybody's on board with it. But you know, in a case where you have like, you know, his kids, my kids, you know. Then what I would suggest is you do a post-marital that says it all out because that discourages the kids from coming back and contesting it. Because that happens. Kids can be, a disgruntled child can be a problem if you don't. I had a, a will that I did not write. I have to preface this. I did not write this will. Someone else wrote this will. This was a gay couple, two guys, before marriage, the law changed and they could get married. One of them took care of the one who died for seven or eight years while he died very slowly of brain cancer. It was inoperable. They took care of each other, he dies. The one who died, the house they had bought it together, he had two vehicles and he had some cash and he left the cars to his parents. He left $10,000 to his sister who accepted the relationship and a dollar to his brothers who wouldn't. Those kids would not cash the stupid dollar check because they were mad. You don't have to leave anything to siblings. I would never have written this will this way. Or I would have said I leave nothing to my brothers for reasons they have knowledge and that's it. I had to go to a judge and ask the judge to close the estate on the judge's own order because those kids would not cash those checks. Because when you make a bequest of $100, $500, whatever, I either have to get a receipt from the person who makes the bequest or I have to provide the canceled check. It took six months and I gave up and I went to the judge and I go, could you please close this estate on your own order because everybody else has signed their receipts. So you have to be careful sometimes if you're omitting a child or you're leaving them less. You have to take away the incentive to contest the will. And it can be done, it's just the right word. And a post-marital would help if you have his and mine, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. and if they're being treated differently. Now, I had one lady, I don't know why she did this, and I don't know why the person who wrote this will did it. She was much younger than her husband, it was a second marriage, and she never thought he would die, she would die first. She had a heart condition, she went in for surgery, she died on the table. Her will did not include him at all, left everything to her daughter. He contested the will. The daughter made him an offer of 10 grand just to walk away and he said no. He got a lawyer, he fought this whole thing. He got put in contempt by a judge because he called the judge a thief. Oh no, this was so entertaining at certain points. <laughs> Finally, the only thing they had was a small house in the West End for $40,000. By the time we paid me, paid all the bills and everything else, he got less than 10 grand. If he had taken the money and run, we never would have had this problem. If she had done a will, I did not do it, this wasn't mine, that included him to some extent, we wouldn't have had this problem. But the daughter said, I'd rather pay you than pay him. I go, okay. When we went through the house and inventory of the house, me, her, his lawyer, him, they counted the doilies. Everybody remember doilies? Mm -hmm. And split up the doilies. Dish towels, a roll of stamps, we counted out the stamps and split it in half. That's how ridiculous and extreme it got. When we got to the basement, 
there was a corner where the daughter, you know, children never leave, they leave their stuff, but they yeah. go. <laughs> Anybody else have that problem? Um, hmm? That's not me. You're not as bad as your sister, you're right. <laughs> she had in the basement Barbie dolls, records, just stuff that was there in boxes. He wanted that too until she could open up the boxes and we opened every single box and I looked at the door and I looked, you're joking, you're right, and he goes, okay, look. That was all her stuff because she goes, look at the Barbie dolls. Some of them have no hair because I cut it off. Yeah. You know, these are not collector's items. And the records were just old 45s. They were used, they weren't even like fancy record label, you know, you could sell one, a Beatles album or something. That's how bad it can get. And then he called the judge a liar and a thief and then he got held overnight. That was fun. <laughs> but I'm willing to do it. Yes, sir. Um, but the purpose, uh, we, we would use a co-executor. There are some families that want to have the backup together in the beginning, that they don't name a backup. They just put, I named Johnny or Jesse or the survivor as my co-executors. And you've got the survivor provision in there. There are some families that it's a concession that they will have both kids to do something, but sometimes, like I've seen it, I had one estate where we had tax returns to file, federal and state estate tax returns. One of them was an accountant, he was on it like this. I couldn't get the other one in the office to sign it, but they don't wanna hurt someone's feelings. Every family has a reason. I don't see a purpose to it. If you're gonna name one because they can do it, then name that one and name the other one as a backup if you have no one else. But to do it because you don't wanna hurt someone's feelings is not the reason to do it because Sometimes that person's not capable of it. So you find the one that's appropriate, pick that one. Now, I, does, I say that and people still do it, so it's not my call. Um, one other question, which I think you addressed a little bit earlier. Uh, I, I, we don't have any kids, but my, I have uh, sisters and brother-in-laws and I give them, we die and give them money mm -hmm. um, to the, my sisters or brother in law or whatever. It's not taxed. Okay, your sister is not taxable to you. Your brother's not taxable to you. But if you reverse it, then their in laws, they are taxable. So it just depends. If you have the same provisions, at some point, one of the in laws or two of the in laws will pay inheritance tax because you have a sister you have a brother if you if you left it to your brother you left it to your sister there'd be no tax mm -hmm. but if you're trying to treat everybody the same they're all going to pay tax at some point regardless of who goes first now uh, if one of the sisters or brothers or brother-in-laws or whatever dies first um, where would where would it go yeah that depends on you. If you tell me, um, for example, my sister has no children, she has a stepchild, my brother has a son. If I left something to my brother and he predeceased me, I can say it goes to him per sturpees, which means to his children. My sister doesn't have any, so it would come back into the estate. So you can decide that if my sister survives me, it can go to her children, or it comes back and it goes to other survivors. That's up to you. There's no rule. Now, if it's silent, it'll go to that next generation. But if there is no next generation, it comes back to the estate. And then it gets divided about the other people. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No? I'll be around if somebody wants. A, a quick question, and you probably covered this. If you have an executor and your executor dies, you name a backup always, at least I do. Uh -huh. And if that person is incapable of it, you can do something called administrator with will and next. So your executor passes away, the next one can't do it. Like in my case here, I had one of those people decline to serve because of illness. So we got someone else, another child to get appointed. What means is as administrator, they're carrying out the terms of the will. I can't call them executor, but I can call them administrator with the will. So typically you make an appointment of one and a backup, I've got some people who put two backups because of the condition of people's health and things like that. Or the other thing too is a codicil, which is up there in one of those words, a codicil is an amendment to your will. What that means is the gentleman who came in to see me yesterday, his son-in-law passed away. He was his backup executor and his daughter who's executor has been diagnosed with cancer. 
So he is naming new backups because he hopes his daughter makes it through, but he's not sure. So he's got a new successor that he's naming. So you don't have to write a new will? No, I just amend one paragraph. That's it. And that'll work if it's a trust too. And if I have to change the trustee, it's a one page amendment that if, you know, you're, I have one lady who sends him in the military. He happens to be in Shanghai right now. Mm -hmm. And he, that's where he's been sent. So she did one that says he's not the backup right now. One of the other kids is. I have another lady, her daughter's got the same thing. The last time I talked to her, she was in Germany. And so she took her off the list because it's impossible for her to come back like that. And she named another child in her place. However, with computers and email, <coughs> PDF scanning and everything else, I file documents electronically. So if she had wanted to leave her daughter who is stationed in Stuttgart, Germany, I could email the paperwork, she could take it to the base JAG office, they would have notarized that she could send it back and we still could appoint her. Problem is, the practical things, selling a house, things like that become more difficult far away. If all you have are bank accounts and stocks and bonds, it can be done by someone who's not exactly physically Louisville. It can be someone in Cincinnati, someone in Chicago. You know, I had, a, I had an executor in um, California who just did his mother's estate here because of the wonders of computers. Um, he even sold the house long distance, so that got done. So if you have to just change one thing, you do it by codicil or amendment. So, yes ma'am. I just can't understand. So if we have three children, mm -hmm. and now all of them, nobody lives here anymore. Mm -hmm. So you're saying like, like, is yeah. Umbert almost put the most responsible one that you feel like will do it for what, as the executor and then put one of the other ones for backup? backup. Yep. Yeah. Always pick the one who's capable of doing the job. <laughs> Don't pick them because they're the oldest and they're supposed to do it. In my house, I just happen to be the oldest, but I also happen to be the one who does the math. And so my brother is the backup. He's, my brother's a lawyer in Miami. So my, like I said, my sister would rather wash windows. So you pick the one who can do it, not because of birth order or anything else. And sometimes it's not the one who lives here either, or the one who's closest. I had one, he was in, this one was really interesting because his dad was here and he was in, he was in Thailand. It wasn't Shanghai, it was Thailand. He did everything long distance. He was a administrative marketing market, some big company out there. We did everything by email including selling the house. He did the whole thing that way, we mailed it back and forth. I overnighted the deed, because I needed an original signature for that. But he was in Thailand for the whole thing. He finally came to meet me once when he came back to the United States. Because he said, all I have is a voice. We didn't have Zoom then. So he came, and he's the cousin of another lawyer. She recommended him to me. So it can be, they can be far away, but pick the one who can do the job. That's the way to do it. And all, and all of you guys, I'll say, it's, it's the favorite one. <laughs> well, but you know, being the favorite one sometimes, you get appointed to do all the crappy jobs, yeah. doesn't make you the favorite. Yeah. It just means you get all the jobs. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> you're, you're yeah. You're in your day when you are so yeah. well. <laughs> Okay. It's true. But I have a thought who, who would probably be more likely to get this stuff. Oh, by the way, ask the question though. I was in a conference room with a woman who had three kids and she was talking to them about who's gonna be the living will surrogate, and who's gonna do the unplugging, and one of them said, I can't do it. Yeah. One of them straight out said, I can't do it. She was 60 years old, the daughter. Mom was 82. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can't do it, put one of them. <laughs> she straight out said, I can't do it. So before you name your kids to unplug you or something else, talk to them. This should not be a secret. Okay, so. Yes, talk to your kids. Talk to our kids, I just tell them, or talk to them ahead of time. Yeah, like my sister, she would, she would, she'd rather do the medical stuff and take mom to the doctor, mm -hmm. which I hate to do. She'll do that. She's good at that. But don't make her do anything that requires numbers. And she's honest. So, yes, sir. What is the best time, and when is the the appropriate um, uh, group of your siblings? Uh, or you get together with your children to start talking about this stuff because yes. your children, you know, they like you say they need to know everything that's going on, but um, they don't want to hear you talk about your death and, and whatnot. Well, are your children twelve? Uh, no, they're much older. Okay, <laughs> that there's no good time, there's no bad time. You tell them we're going to have a meeting, we're going to talk about this. I want you there because we're telling you what we're going to do. Yeah. 
and I want you to know what's going to happen, and I don't want this to be a surprise. Yeah. And you tell them, I expect you to be here. There's no good time or bad time. We've had those meetings at my office mm -hmm. because they want, they knew that one child was going to get upset, so they wanted a third party like mediator. I got a conference room that seats ten people. Bring them in. But mom felt much more comfortable doing it at my office than at her house because they knew that they'd be they'd be embarrassed to walk out of a meeting in my office, mm -hmm. whereas grandma's house they can they're out. I can't do this. I'm leaving. But here, when you put them all in the same room, the other ones will put the pressure. Wait, you can't go anywhere. And that's exactly what happened with that case. One of them was going to leave, and the other said, sit down. And it wasn't mom who said, sit down. It was another sibling. So there's no good time. There's no bad time. It's whenever you make a decision about what you want to do, that you sit them down and say, this is what I'm doing. So there's that. So it sounds like, like you highly recommend to get like stuff situated, especially the power of it. And that's then, a, in my opinion, that's the most important document. Uh -huh. Because once you're gone, there's a statute that can even govern it. But while you're alive and someone has to take care of you, they need to have the ability to do it. And that means they can pay your bills, they can authorize medical care if it's a medical power of attorney, but they can't do that if you don't, if your kids don't sign on your accounts, if they can't get into your safe deposit box if you have one. So that's why you need a power of attorney. That's more important than the will because if, if you die without a will, statute says husband and wife gets half, kids get the other half. That's gonna be determined. The law's there. It's what happens while you're alive and you need help. That's why the power of attorney and the will are really important documents. Yes, ma'am. So you have a power of attorney and you name, uh, what is the person? The executor. The attorney in fact. The attorney in fact. Do and you the power attorney. always have a backup? Yes, attorney? on every document you have a backup. I do. I do not do one without a backup because we've had some old documents that come across your table that were written 50 years ago that did not have them and then the kids, nobody can do anything if your number one is gone. So you always have to have a backup. And that, it's not always a child either. So did I understand right, like we could each be power of attorney and yes. then have back up our children as, mm -hmm. as a Exactly. Okay. Yeah, like mine, it's my husband. And I think my brother is my backup because you guys were little when I did this. So my brother, the attorney, is the other one. And at one point, before we did them again, we had guardians named, which were my parents, and raised the executor, and my father was the backup. That's changed. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, you are each other's initially in most cases. You know, if you don't have a spouse, that's, you don't have a spouse, but if you're married and your spouse is capable, you name your spouse. I've had a couple who told me they don't want to do it, and that's between them, and then they come back and they've talked again, and they've changed it back to each other, but that's because of whatever reason I wasn't privy to. And then the kids are the backups, or nieces and nephews, or whatever. Some people don't have kids, so. Um, if you have a pet and you want to provide for your pet, I've almost forgot this because I got yelled at by someone for not mentioning it. You can provide for your pet. There's a thing called a pet trust. I have. One or two different clients. One has a pet trust for her parrot. Did you know parrots live to be 100? Yes. I did not know that. When she told me that, I go, huh? So yeah, I have a pet trust for another client who has two horses. I have one for a dog. I mean, so you can do pet trusts if you have no children but have pets and they're your babies. Um, that happens. Um, there are trusts that exist for charitable reasons. There are trusts that uh, exist for to hold life insurance. There's all kinds of trusts out there, but I usually mention the pets because there are some people who their pets are their children, and you know it happens. What should uh, should I do? And then I have a, a will that is older than him, and uh, and my lawyer keeps saying or telling me, but it's very old. It's like from 40 or 50 years ago. Well, does it say what you want it to say? Yeah, yeah but that's the thing. It's like, it, but then it doesn't it. serve you. If it doesn't say what you want it to say, yeah. then it's not the will that you need. I don't know who your lawyer is. Don't tell me. That's none of my business. But if, you're, if you've told him that you want to change things, then he's, not, he's doing you a disservice by saying, no, leave it alone. If it's not saying, I want everything to go to my spouse and then equal shares to my kids or whatever, then you need to change it. Yeah, no, I was uh, young and didn't really know what I was Buying, but I knew I had to have something. Mm -hmm. And for this one, I never understood why he put the trust to a certain bank 
<laughs> because he had a relationship with yeah, that's what I have today. And, uh, yeah, now, that's what I know now. Yeah, yeah, and if you don't like that bank, yeah. or you don't bank with that bank, then that's another reason to change it. Also, some of those older wills have banks that don't exist anymore. Right. Like if you had change names or anything. If you had Republic Bank as your trustee, mm -hmm. they don't have a trust department anymore. Yeah. BB and T is now Truist. Yeah. National City became PNC. Yeah. Chase no longer had. And Liberty mm -hmm. became Bank One and then became Chase. And you, if you have a trust with them, because it's a succession, it's out of Dallas. Yeah. So, um, yeah. First Kentucky Trust doesn't exist anymore. It got bought by National City. And of course, they you send you letters letting you know this, but you put that somewhere you don't remember mm -hmm. yeah. you know, who your trustee is or what. And then um, if uh, um, I forgot my train of thought there. No, but but if your question was if the your will doesn't say exactly what you wanted to say, then you probably need to talk to that person and say this isn't what I want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just confused because. Like a lot of times you think, well, you know, you want to provide for the spouse, and then once we're both gone, then everything goes to the kids. Exactly. So I don't, but That's it fine. sounds like a lot of the stuff you were saying that it, that it goes like when somebody dies, a lot of times half of it goes to the. That's if you fund. don't have a will. Ah. If you don't have a will, that's what happens. Or you omit your spouse on purpose. That's what happens, because your spouse can throw your will out to the extent that it includes them. Now, if you have a will and everything's in there that says all my joint property, you don't even deal with that, it goes to the joint owner, everything else goes to my spouse, and then it goes to my kids, if my spouse doesn't survive me, that's what's going to happen. Your spouse will get everything. So. Is it possible that there needs to be somebody in the same country? Um, I've seen it done once or twice with people out of town. It just depends on the institutions that they would be working with. I had a lady who was from Argentina, and she was a doctor here. Her guardians were in Argentina. Her power of attorney was in London, because that's where her brother was. He's a doctor there. So they do not have to be here. And I have another client whose one brother's in London and one brother's in Canada. I've got a son in England, that's all. There's no problem. With computers now, I can record your power of attorney, and they will honor it. They'll just we deal with the time difference, that's all. We even did an estate where one of the executors was in London. So, now the lady with the Argentinian doctor, they ended up going back to Argentina, so I don't know what they're doing now. Um, she got a job back home, so she went back to Argentina. So, her and her husband, there were two doctors here. But her brother was in London, that's where he got his medical thing. So, there were a bunch of doctors. So, but no, they don't have to be here. What do you think about joint wills? They don't do them anymore. Oh, really? But there's no guarantee that the joint will on the second go round that the person hasn't done another one. So I know I've never written a joint will. That's how long ago we stopped doing them. I've probated a few that were leftovers from other people, mm -hmm. but nobody does joint wills anymore because it's sort of like a restriction on your ability to handle your affairs. So nobody does that anymore. So okay, it is twelve thirteen. And I know Eric has stood up. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.